people can trickle in as they do. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Bill Masaruti, who is uh, visiting us from Princeton. So he did his uh, PhD uh, back in Grenoble. So we have someone who replaced Emmanuel, who is our resident Frenchman who's left, you know, so now he's here standing in temporarily. Uh, and then he did a uh, postdoc at Boulder, uh, where one of the things he did a lot of work on that he won't be talking about today is uh, the giant flares from the crowd. Uh, Magnetic reconnection, uh, and now he's uh, doing his postdoc at Princeton, and will be telling us about particle acceleration and pulsars. Thank you, Ian. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very excited to, to tell you about the very new results that I've presented only three days ago to, in Princeton. And so feel free to interrupt me if you, if you need more explanation or something. I, I still need to uh, make sure that things are uh, understandable. <laughs> So what I'm going to talk about here is a kind of an old problem, which is how do we understand this, the slowdown, the spin down of neutron stars? So we know that they, they, spin, they spin down and that they release a lot of this energy into the form of radiation. So in, in radio, of course, but all the way to high energy gamma rays. So we, we know that these systems accelerate particles to very high energies, and the best evidence for this comes from the, the high energy gamma rays in particular from the, the Fermilat uh, Gamma Ray Space Telescope. So what you, what you can see here is a map of the whole sky of like all these dots are pulsars. And all the, the dots with colors are pulsars that were detected by Fermi. And there's like about 100 of these of such uh, pulsars that were discovered in, in our galaxy. And it turns out that most of the gamma ray sources are in fact pulsars. Um, so we have a lot of data, and we can even classify these objects into two distinct groups. Uh, they are like the, these guys over here that are plotted in this diagram, which is known as the PP dot diagram. So on the left, you see the, how fast the, the neutron star is slowing down. So it's giving you an idea of the, of the power of the, uh, of the power released by, by the pulsar as a function of its spin period. So these guys here are, are thought to be more like uh, young objects. Uh, young pulsars with very intense magnetic fields, 10 to the 12 Gauss, and about like, something like 100 millisecond spin period. And there's a second population that is over here, uh, which are thought to be old pulsars, or we call them recycled pulsars, millisecond pulsars. They have a low magnetic field, uh, at least relative to, to the young guys. And they have uh, so 10 to the 9 Gauss, and they have about uh, a few millisecond spin period. So the, the thing that is uh, in common between these two populations is that the, the energy that is released uh, comes from the rotation of, of, the sp of the neutron stars. So these are really rotation-powered uh, objects. So eventually what you will see uh, in terms of radiation will come from the, the spin-down power here. So this is the reservoir of energy that we have. So what is quite striking is that, so I'm, I'm still looking at these gamma ray pulsars, is that a large fraction of this pin down power is converted to high efficiency in terms of ga in, into gamma rays. So you can see this into this diagram where all these gamma ray pulsars were put in, into this. Uh, here you have on the x-axis the, the spin down power. So this, again, this, this power uh, due to the loss of uh, rotation energy, rotational energy. And on the left, you have the gamma ray luminosity, so how much gamma rays this object is uh, shining. This dashed line here is showing you the 100% efficiency. Like the whole the sp all the spin down is converted into gamma rays. And this line is more like uh, goes a square root of, uh, of, the, of the spin down. So more or less, typically you have pulsars that they manage to release 1 to 10% of the spin down in terms of high energy gamma rays. So it's a, it's a very efficient uh, problem here, a very efficient uh, process that is at work here. So the, just the, the mechanism of how does the, the star spin down and gives this energy to particles and then to radiation, this is still not clear how, how does it work. Where and how in pulsars. So just a couple questions. The, yes? The millisecond guys without the, um, without the coordinates, those have no radio yeah. counterpart? Uh, which one? The, uh, the uh huh. Oh, the, you mean all, all these guys, or this, yeah. this guy here? Without the coordinates, that means they have no radio ID. Or ah, I, I don't I don't know about that actually. 
may, maybe that's true. I, so, so this one I know is the crab, but, but the other one I'm not, I'm not sure which one uh, they are. Um, and the other thing one takes oh, from this is yeah. that the e to the one half scaling that was derived for the longer period pulsars originally. That's right. I mean, it looks more like they're just sort of you know shifted down from the L gamma equals e dot curve. I mean, there, yes, there are uh -huh. a few outliers on the right, but. Right. But there's a characteristic efficiency of 10% or something like that. Something like that, right. So here it is also something of the distance and the beaming factor that is kind of uh, make things a bit more difficult to understand. But the point is that it's, it's very efficient. You, you convert a lot of this uh, rotational energy in, into particles. So the question is, so how do we do that? Uh, then the, the last uh, very striking thing is still in gamma rays is that if you look at the spectrum, now of the radiation that is observed, it kind of all look pretty similar. It all look, always looks like some sort of bump, like over here, uh, a hard power low, with then a break, a cutoff, and then it, it just roll off exponentially to high energies. And the cutoff always happens to be more or less at a GV or so. So this is st still not clear where does this typical energy come from, and how do you form such spectra? It seems to be like there is something very simple that is producing all of the spectra here. All right, so what exactly are we talking about here? Um, so I'm going to review uh, roughly how, how do we understand pulsars, the, the structure of the magnetosphere, and where do people think uh, the, the particle acceleration occurs and the high energy emission. So just consider like a neutron star. We know that these guys are highly magnetized objects, so they have this 10 to the 12 Gauss uh, magnetic field structure. And imagine that it's like a, a dipole field structure frozen in onto the surface. Now, imagine you're in vacuum, you just have this dipole, and you just spin it. As you spin the star, you will induce an electric field due to the, the fast rotation of the field lines. And this electric field will have the effect to pull out charges to accelerate particles from the surface of the star's electrons which are thought to be accelerated by this strong electric field that is induced by the rotation, as it accelerates, will produce some photons, typically curvature radiation, because the, the field lines are curved. This uh, curvature radiation is typically gamma rays emission that will be absorbed by the magnetic field of the, of the star that will produce an electron-positron pair. This annihilation of pairs, uh, this annihilation of gamma rays will produce pairs that will be accelerated once more, once again, produce more gamma rays that will pair produce, et cetera, et cetera. So at the end, you have this cascade that is induced just by a single particles, where you will produce like a, a rich plasma of electrons and positrons. So, the, so to the first approximation, we believe that the magnetosphere around pulsars is not empty, it's not vacuum, but it's filled with this dense plasma of electron-positron pairs. So as the, as the neutron star is uh, rapidly rotating, the field lines will not stay dipolar. What will happen is that there is a characteristic uh, scale in the pulsars, which is called the light cylinder, which is uh, the distance at which, if you want to co-rotate with the star, so the magnetosphere is, is rotating, if you want to co-rotate with the star, you have to go at the speed of light in rigid rotation. So if you go beyond this point, you will not be able to co-rotate with the star because you will have to go faster than the speed of light. So what happens is that the field lines uh, that are enclosed within the light cylinder will remain closed. So this is the closed zone, which is called the closed zone, which will be filled with plasma. But these, these other field lines close to the polar cap, to the poles of the neutron star, will, will open up beyond the light cylinder because they are crossing the light cylinder distance. And so as it does, the field line will try to keep up with co-rotation, but it can't. So what happens is that the, the field lines will start to uh, wind around the neutron star. So you, you would form, you would create some uh, toroidal magnetic field. So the, the field lines will form a spiral like this. But the field lines that are on, on one hemisphere will uh, spiral in one direction, and the one in the other uh, pole will, on the opposite direction, will uh, spiral in this other direction. So you will form like, the, you will have a, a discontinuity in the, in the toroidal magnetic field. And because you have a discontinuity in the magnetic field, we have a current sheet. You have to have a current sheet to support this change of magnetic field. 
oops. And because this, these sphere lines are open and not closed anymore, the plasma is just free to escape. And this plasma will form the wind of the neutron star. So if you look far from the neutron star, the field lines look like a radial uh, field lines loaded with plasma that is frozen in into the field lines. All right, so where do we think that the gamma ray of the acceleration of particles come from? Well, the, the first models that were uh, proposed is that, well, acceleration we know might come from the, the polar cap. As I told you, there's this strong induced electric field that is pulling out charges, electrons, and so it's quite natural to imagine that you have gamma rays coming from this region. So it's more like polar cap regions. There's this other type of models where uh, called more like outer gap because they are further out the magnetosphere, where they propose that the, the acceleration of particles will, will happen along the open field lines here. So this is the kind of the classical model of uh, uh, the, the way that people interpret the, the gamma rays from pulsars. But there's actually one more uh, culprit for emission of gamma rays, which is more and more popular, which is the, uh, so again, this, this region that is called the separatrix between the open field lines and the closed field lines. But more importantly, the current sheet. Because the current sheet, you can, you can imagine that it will be, there will be some sort of resistivity, that you will kind of have a dissipation in this current sheet. And in particular, uh, reconnection, so where, where field lines annihilate uh, in the equator. So these were uh, already proposed uh, back in 1990 by Coroniti to explain how pulsars dissipate so much magnetic energy in the form of kinetic energy. All right, so, so what you can see from this kind of sketch uh, is that it's very important to know what's the structure of the magnetosphere, because you need to know uh, accurately if you want to distinguish between these models, uh, is this picture c correct? And the way to do this, uh, which was done only uh, in 2000 for the first time, 1999, which is kind of recent if you think about it, um, was to simulate the whole magnetosphere with MHD simulations, or in the force free limit as well. So the idea here is that you assume that your magnetosphere is filled with plasma everywhere. There's so much plasma everywhere that it's perfectly conducting, and uh, you can apply the image limit so that E dot B uh, equal zero everywhere. And so you can see that it was pretty good, this, this sketch, that you have, again, this structure with this closed zone over here, and uh, beyond the light cylinder, which is over here, the field lines opens up in the form of this uh, monopolar-like field lines, so radial field lines. So here, this is the, the toroidal magnetic field that you can see. You can see that the, the magnetic field is reversing here. And there is a, a zone with no magnetic field where you have a strong current sheet. So I will come back to this. But, so everybody more or less agree on this structure. So there was like, a, like a many, many simulations in, in the 2000, even up to 2012, about simulating the magnetosphere of pulsars. But the problem is that, uh, well, it's MHD. So you are not able to tell how particles are accelerated. You don't have any information on the, on the acceleration of particles. So you're kind of stuck. OK, the, we have now the, the structure of the magnetosphere, but how do you do to, to go beyond that? Well, it's particularly uh, a problem because um, with the MHD limit, because uh, it's quite embarrassing because the, where the MHD breaks down, the MHD approximation breaks down, it's this region which are actually of interest for acceleration of particles. Because these are regions typically where ideal emission does not apply, where you have E dot B non equal to zero, and you can have region where E is greater than B, the electric field greater than the magnetic field. So you, you just can't explain uh, the acceleration of particles with, with this. And as I'm going to show you later on, uh, also you are neglecting uh, kinetic effects uh, so at the scale of the Larmor radius of particles with this that you cannot capture. And also there's something important here is that the, the plasma is not neutral in, in pulsars. And I, I will show you this. So all of this to say that we need to go beyond the MHD approach. And to go beyond that, there is a way to do this, which is to use particle in cell simulations. So I will explain to you uh, a little bit later on what, what do I mean by this. 
And I, I'd like to point out one more thing to convince you that we need to go beyond the MHD approach, which is that the, the, the structure of the, uh, of the magnetosphere that I just showed you is actually one, one solution. But there are actually many, many types of magnetosphere that depends on how much plasma you inject into the magnetosphere. So if you imagine now there's, there's no cascade, there's no cascade uh, and also no uh, pair creation. What will happen is that this is a solution that is known already from uh, Gore Wright Julian, uh, so it's kind of one of the first theoretical paper on, on pulsars. Um, you would just pull out the, 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 the particles from the star, but you would not produce a, a cascade that will kind of fill the entire magnetosphere with plasma. So what will happen is that you will pull out charges from the neutron star until this plasma is dense enough to screen the electric field that is induced by the rotation of field lines. And this density is called the go right julian density. So I, I will come back to this also uh, later on. Yes, that's right, because here we have positrons. That's right. Uh, in if it were just letting the surface be a source of equal mass, positive and negative charges. Uh -huh. Oh, you mean this calculation? Yes, yes. But in practice, uh, you might have to, to extract uh, ions, which is much more difficult. <laughs> yes. Right. So these pulsars are thought to be, uh, well, it might, it might exist in, uh, in reality. It's just that we, we, we would not see them. We, they would not radiate. They would not spin down. Because these guys are, this is a static structure. Once it's established, it just doesn't move. And so also you see that the field lines are just dipolar. They are not changed by the plasma. Well, that's an interesting, I think, unresolved question. You have here a centered dipole, right? Yeah. With a lot of symmetry, so yes. Yes. But it's starting charges up a bit, and then you have no loss of charges along. Mm -hmm. But if that's it's true. not a symmetric dipole, it's, mm -hmm. it's not clear what happens. Right, so there's, there's also this 3D effect, the, this diacrotron instability uh, that, that tends to actually uh, release a little bit of, uh, of energy. So there's a little bit of spin down, actually, if you... And in the... Are you thinking about the misaligned rotator, maybe? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about the... Well, even the misaligned case. Uh -huh. but, but if you have a non-centered dipole, for example... Oh, I see. Yes. Of course people expect that. That's right. That's right, yeah. So. The question is, can one have a continued loss? Obviously, you have equal numbers of the two signs of charges continuously being lost. That's right. But can you really entirely shut off the charge flow? Uh, pro in reality, probably not. Yeah, that, that's hard to imagine that. Yes, that's true. Yes. Yeah. So the other case I've already introduced to you, this is the, the case where you have plasma everywhere. The, 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 the magnetosphere is, is a good conductor everywhere, and you have again this wind with a lot of energy losses from the neutron star. And you can see that this solution does spin down, and you have here the, the spin down of the, of the neutron star as a function of the obliquity. So this is the, uh, the angle between the magnetic axis and the rotation axis. So what I've shown you always here was the, the aligned case, just for simplicity, but you could imagine that for real pulsars, there would be always a non-zero angle. All right, so we want to go beyond that, and we want to understand in particular, OK, we have two extreme cases. Uh, how does it work in between, which might be something more realistic? And here again, we need to have something like a more fundamental, a more fundamental approach. And this more fundamental approach to describe a plasma is to use the particle in-cell simulations. So the idea is very simple. Um, you have, imagine you have a domain here, like a square uh, domain. Uh, physical domain, and you have this uh, mesh, and at every point of this mesh, you know the electromagnetic field, E and B, that you solve with Maxwell's equation. And on top of this, uh, you put plasma. But you don't, you don't describe the plasma in terms of a fluid, but rather you use just particles. These particles don't represent like just one physical particle, but they actually represent many particles, or we call them macroparticles. So they could represent like billions of physical particles. But the point is that you approximate your distribution function of the particles in terms of like individual particles, that you, and, you will, and you look at their individual motion. So you, you, you compute the equation of motion of these particles with uh, Newton's uh, equation. 
And then at, so at every time step, you do this, the following loop. So you, you solve the equation of motion of the particles. From the motion of particles, you, you deduce the, the currents, the charge densities. That would be source terms into Maxwell's equations. So you do this in one time step. And then you go back. You have uh, updated your, your electromagnetic field. And then you solve again the equation of motion and so on. So you have like a self-consistent uh, description of the plasma from particles and fields. So you can really solve the acceleration of particles. Yes? What are the properties of these particles? Do they just have charges or do they have like holes? No, they just have charge and mass, like, in, like a, a real electron. Uh, if, since, they're big, since they're groups of particles, I might have thought that, say, yeah, I might have thought that the higher multiples are important. Um, so all right, so this is an, so you approximate this as you imagine that it's like as if there was like uh, a thousand or millions of the same like of, of electron that would be exactly the same phase space uh, point in the phase space. They would share the same uh, exact same motion. That, that's the idea. So if you have many many of those particles, you get closer and closer to uh, the behavior of a real plasma. That's the idea. I think what matters is that the particles are simply small compared with the characteristic wave on the modes that are being decided in the other. So is this in some sense the Dubai approximation? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right, so why, why is this simulation skinking in now, nowadays? Well, the reason is because, um, well, the, you need a lot of computing power. You have to imagine that you, you, you have like 10 to the 8, 10 to the 10 particles, so 2D, 3D. Um, and you, have, you need to have a very large system uh, because you, you, you need to, if you want to resolve all the scales of a microscopic uh, system like pulsars, you need to, to have a lot of uh, a large separation of scale between the Larmor radius of the particles and a scales like the, the Larmor, uh, the, the radius of the star, for instance. So of course, we can reproduce the whole thing here in our computing box. But we try to stretch all these, all these scales as far as possible. And we hope that it will not change too much, the, at least qualitatively, the, the main results. So there was uh, just uh, last year, or this year, already a few attempts to do simulations of the magnetosphere with PIC. So pick four particle in cell. But the, the problem is that uh, contrary to, to MHD, you have here uh, another degree of freedom. What do you do to the particles? You have to inject particles. So you need to know what, how much to inject and how and where. So one way to do this, uh, which was presented first by uh, so Sasha Filipov and Anatoly Spitkovsky, who are my collaborator, um, which is to imagine that you dump plasma everywhere into the magnetosphere. So it's a bit like the MHD case. You imagine they have plasma everywhere. So here, this is what they do. They do every time step. They dump the magnetosphere with plasma. And what they get, not surprisingly, they, they got back to a structure that is exactly like force free. Very similar. You see the closed zone here. And this is what is shown here is the toroidal magnetic field. But the thing that they got with these simulations, they found evidence of particle acceleration into the current sheet in, in this region here. So I will come back to this also. There was a second attempt, uh, which uh, used a different uh, approach. Uh, so this is a paper by uh, Alexander Chen and Andrei Belobrodov at Columbia University, uh, which is to, to, to take the problem like from first principle to just say, OK, I'm going to solve now the, the whole uh, cascade, electromagnetic cascade, into the polar cap. And what they found here is that if you just peer produce very close to the neutron star, what happens is that the, at the beginning of the simulation, things will, uh, will form like a nice, uh, nice uh, structure, like the MHD uh, says. But it will, it's not stable. It will, uh, eventually, it will collapse. The, the peer creation here will be too intense. As you will screen out the electric field, acceleration will die. And at the end, you, you don't have a pulsar. You kind of collapse to this, uh, remember this. Uh, static structure with a, a dome and a disk of uh, the two different species. So what they, what they found is that you need to have per creation or acceleration of particles to high energies much further out into the current sheet. 
So this is another indication that the current sheet is an important, plays an important role here in the acceleration of particles. Yes. Um, so it's more like um, it's more an experiment. That's how they, they call it. That um, they well. So the polar cap we expect to have to have per creation from curvature radiation, but into the current sheet it, it's not. It cannot be uh, from the, the magnetic field per production. So what they do here is that they invoke that these uh, photons, the background photons that would per-produce like photon-photon collision, collision that would per-produce in these regions. So I think it's more like a, a, a parameter that they choose in their, in their simulation to be able to turn on or off the, uh, the per-creation here. So I think it's not fully self-consistent from this point of view. So we get that in our gap models. In, in, the, in the current sheet as well? Or well. Close to the, right, close well, to the Y point. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. My approach to this was to say, okay, so the, the cascade problem is, is complex. It's very difficult. So even in, in Chen and Burrow's board of uh, analysis, they had to simplify greatly the problem because the scales are tiny. It's like uh, uh, orders and orders of magnitudes much smaller than uh, the scale that we can resolve here. So here I have a much simpler approach, which is to say, all right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to provide the star with some plasma, and the star will just take whatever it wants from this. So I'm, I'm kind of controlling the amount I want to give to the star, and from this, from, uh, from this parameter I will show you later on, that I, I provide, uh, then what happens? How does the, the, the magnetosphere react to this? And from this, um, from this analysis, I can kind of, I can look at how much, depending on how much per creation I have, uh, what's the structure of the magnetosphere? How particles are accelerated? So it's more like, a, I assume that there is, per, there is a cascade. I don't resolve the physics of the cascade. I just, what I do is I just tune how efficient the ca cascade is. So you have some multiplicity Exactly, right. Some multiple the charge charge Exactly. So I, I, will, I, will go to, I will come back to this. Uh, all right, so to, so to do this, um, I'm using the, the PICO that I've developed. So it's a, it's a fully relativistic three-dimensional PIC code that I developed from scratch at the University of Colorado. So the, this code was uh, first intended to uh, model reconnection, relativistic reconnection, in particular for, to explain, as I mentioned, the, the, the gamma ray flares in the crab. Um, and so what I change here uh, into the code to, to tackle this problem is to do two-dimensional axisymmetric simulations. And so for, for this, you need to, do, uh, to have a spherical mesh for the peak code. And so the advantages of doing this is that you can, you can have very high resolution. Uh, the, the simulations are cheap, so you can, you can, you can be able to, to, to do a very high resolution resolved sim simulations. And the, the other reason, which is more like computational also, uh, is that the boundary condition is a big issue for, for such a problem, uh, the injection of particles in particular. And in the case of the spherical symmetry for the, for the domain, it's much more trivial to do this. It's, it's not easy, but it's, it's much easier than uh, in the other geometry. All right, so this is how the setup looks like. Uh, so the, the computational domain uh, starts at, uh, at the surface of the star. Uh, which is the, in, the inner uh, radius boundary, and extend up to uh, outer boundary, which is far from the light cylinder radius. Remember, this is radius where the, the wind is launched. Um, I start with a dipole. Here, I have to have an O-line dipole because it's 2D. And I have also an outer boundary that is kind of like a shell around my box that is able to absorb any electromagnetic wave and particles, just to have like a purely absorbing boundary. And now this is the tricky part. So uh, this is the inner boundary. Um, so here, uh, as I said, we, want to, we don't want to do any assumption of the cascade. We just want to say, OK, there is a cascade into the magnetosphere. Uh, and what I do is that I inject a very magnetized plasma into this, this uh, first row of cell and inject it with some uh, fraction 
of the goal range union density, so this goal range union density we just mentioned, is this minimum kind of fiducial density that, you, that the, the neutron star we want to have into, the, into the, the magnetosphere to screen out the electric field that is induced by the rotation. So this parameter here is the, the parameters that, it's not exactly the multiplicity, I will come back to this, but it's a fraction of goal region that inject at every time step. So it's not really physical, it's more numerical. And also the, the thing is that I give them a little kick to the particle, half the speed of light. And the reason for this is because in the electromagnetic cascade, uh, the particle have momentum as they, as they pair produce, they're accelerated, they have some momentum. Because if you don't give them a kick, the particle will just want to stay around the star. That's what you find when you do the simulations. All right, so this is kind of numerical, but in terms of physics, what, what does it mean? All right, so this is uh, what we, we just mentioned. So this is Gauray Julian density, uh, NJG, which is this uh, fiducial density, and I will give I will give some fraction of this at every time step. Once the simulation is well established, what kind of density do I have in the magnetosphere? So usually in, in, in pulsars, we, we parameterize the, the density of the plasma. We scale it to, to this Gauray-Julian density, and we name it kappa, which is the multiplicity. How much do I have with respect to, uh, to the Gauray-Julian density? In real pulsars, the gamma-ray pulsars, we, we think that this number is huge, like a thousand, maybe even more. And what we get in the simulations is uh, multiplicities that are typical uh, where well, we vary actually the, the number of uh, injection here, and we can get from sub, uh, sub gauge Julian density, so there's not enough density to screen out the electric field, to uh, a region where the multiplicity is greater than one, where we expect that now we are more like MHD approach. So this is at the pole, at the polar cap, but you can see that elsewhere in the, in, in the, in the magnetosphere, the multiplicity can be much higher, like 100. So these are very uh, important changes in the multiplicity in the, in the magnetosphere. And how do you handle the pair creation in between the two? Do so you have further injection of pairs beyond this boundary uh, layer? No. 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 So in fact, it's just geometry. Uh, yeah, so you, you let the, the, the system evolve. And what would happen is that, uh, at, at least contrary to what I thought, there will, the, there will be not the same density of plasma everywhere. The, the neutron star will kind of sort out the, the species depending on where, where it is. You, you, you will see this more clearly towards the end. So now let's look more into the, uh, the, the low multiplicity case. Well, another question. Yes? Do you supply the plasma on the close field lines as well as the open All right, so, so at the beginning, yes. Uh, but we have a limiter here, which we say, okay, we, we, don't, want the in, we don't want to over-inject in the, into the closed zone because this would be not physical. So we say, okay, once the, the closed zone is filled, we, we stop injecting. That's, that's the idea. But there is, a, there is like a, a threshold. So we, if there's not enough, we, we keep on injecting. We this kind of like a, want to keep this zone uh, always filled, but not too much. It's tricky. <laughs> this kind of rod, I gather, weren't doing that, right? They were only injecting the open field ones? Uh, so, they were, so they were using the, uh, the, uh, the pre-creation from the polar cap. Yes, yeah, so it was only from the open field lines. That's right. So I'm going to review now the two, these two solutions. So we, we performed all these type of simulations with different multiplicity of the poles. And I'm going to review these two cases, kind of a low multiplicity case and the high multiplicity case and see what happens. All right, so let's start with the low multiplicity case. This, is, this movie shows you how the uh, the evolution of the toroidal magnetic field. You see that we, there's like an important transient at the beginning. This is because we start from vacuum. There's no plasma, pure dipolar magnetic field. So it's going a bit fast, but if you see you have a purely dipolar magnetic field, you build up toroidal magnetic field, and you, f and you open field lines. And you see, as expected, the field lines tends to be more and more radial. So let's, let's play it once again. I'm sorry, can you repeat? F inch, the, the oh, F inch is constant. It's constant. It's constant, yeah. And then how is logarithmic? Um, in terms of the, the B, B phi? Yeah. B phi? Uh, no, it's, it's linear here. Yeah. 
Right, so you see that there's a few field lines that are still open outside, so, so it's normal. It's because this region I will show you is resistive. So the field lines are dragging into the, they're not co-rotating, of course. But. So you, you've seen that there is this discontinuity in the, into the magnetic field, toroidal magnetic field, so it means that you need to have a poroidal electric field to support the current sheet. So this is what you see here. This is the radial uh, current density times R squared. And the curve shows you positive or negative uh, uh, radial current. So here what you see is uh, a strong <laughs> kind of uh, a strong current sheet, strong current, radial current that is flying out. And you, so you see that the current is flying out at the equator and it's coming back towards the pole. So you have a closed system. Of course, we don't have the, the whole closure of the current into the box. So presumably in real pulsars, it will happen in the, in the nebula when the, the wind terminates. So you have this typical pattern of, of current flying out and coming back in. Um, but you see here an important difference from what I showed you before. So indeed, we have the closed zone here. Uh, but there is no like real separatrix. The separatrix is very kind of diffuse. There is no like a, a sharp uh, change between open field lines versus closed field lines, like in the MHD case. It's because we're in the low multiplicity regime. And this was, this was in fact uh, proposed recently by a, a group, the Contopoulos et al., uh, where in fact they argue that the uh, uh, the current sheet here is supported by um, electrostatic forces. Another question we've been here in uh -huh. where the field is moving around, uh -huh. your particles will be gyrating around, right? The, uh, so which there will be some gyrational degree of freedom of the particles around the magnetic field. Uh -huh. Yes. Maybe, maybe not at the surface, but uh -huh. once you get close to the light cylinder, it looks like that will be excited. Um, right. so, so you mean that they would jump from one field line to another, or? Well, I mean, the Part of it, in the frame where, at least in the part of the magnetosphere where D is bigger than E, uh -huh. yes. you move to the frame where D is equal to zero, yes. and then yeah. ask is the particle velocity along the magnetic field in that frame. Right. 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 So, um, Sorry, well, are you asking if it's for a screen? No, 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 no. I'm saying is that there will be some radiative damping of the particle motion. Oh, yes, yes. Pro yes, yes. The way the numbers work, as I recall, uh -huh. that you have like a chemical gas magnetic field, uh -huh. and you are at the light cylinder, and the particle has a significant fraction of the total voltage, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then there's a critical spin period of about a second this long. Like oh, okay. I'm not aware of that. That's the low interesting. Pitch, uh -huh. The magnet is, the light cylinder is compact enough. Yes. That gyrations are very rapidly damped. So it's hard for particles to cross field lines. All right, so you, I will show you later on the orbits of particles. So indeed, we are more like into this regime where the Ramon radius is, is kind of large compared to the, yeah, that's, that's interesting. But if you didn't have any particle, it's easy to put in. You guys to put in just yes, in. yes, that's right. So I, I forgot to mention here, there's no, uh, I neglect the radiative cooling here. That is probably very important. Uh, so this will be the, the next step. But we, we try to, to see if we understand for, for now at this point. All right, so this was for the field and the currents. But what about the particles themselves? This is the plasma density of positrons. On positrons. And what you see here is that what, what's coming out of it is mostly uh, the closed zone here and this very strong current sheet, but not so much at high latitude. And it's pretty striking if you now look at the electrons, if you compare the two, you see that it's fairly charge separated that the current sheet is mostly positively charged. So this is the same color scheme, by the way. So we can really compare by eye, at least. Uh, sorry. So you have mostly, pulse, uh, most, mostly electrons at the pulse and mostly uh, positrons at the equator. So you have this very kind of charge-separated structure that you cannot resolve with MHD. All right, so what, what, does, it, what does it tell us now in terms of the slowing down of the so yes. this is qualitatively what you would have expected just from the overlap of omega and d, right? Uh, sorry, from the overlap of? Omega dot b, the sine of omega dot b. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, yes. How close is that correspondence between the, 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 the net sign of the charge density and omega dot b? So it's, 
it's close, but not quite. So the, the, this is critical line uh, that is somewhere, I, I think it's, um, let's see, uh, that really chart separated the two. Uh, but I don't think you, this critical line has major importance here. Um, but you see that there is an overlap still. There is a little bit of overlap between the two species. You see there is a little bit of electrons here, uh, definitely a lot here. So it's, it's really, I would say, a, kind of a hybrid between the kind of the high multiplicity case and the, and the low multiplicity case. And the, the, the lowest the multiplicity you inject uh, the, in your boundary, at your inner boundary, you, you get the closest you get to the disk dome, to the dead pulsar, okay, the statically. And we also recovered the, the, the static uh, disk dome case uh, if, you, if you inject just enough to screen the electric field. So, if, so this case collapsed to the, so it's kind of really in between. It's really the transition, I, I believe so. That's how I interpret it. All right, so now uh, what we are really interested in, how much the star is, uh, is losing power. So this is what is shown here. This is the, the spin down. So how, what's the power lost by the neutron star in, in the form of this uh, toroidal magnetic field of pointing flux. And this value here at the light cylinders is usually the value that is compared, uh, that is compared between different groups. Um, and this, this value is about 85% of the value that people find in the image delimit, this L0 here. So this is what force, force free tells you. And, and we found a little bit less. We found a little bit less because the magnetosphere doesn't have enough current. We don't have enough plasma to kind of support to open uh, enough field lines. Uh, oh, right. And <laughs> the important thing is uh, now is that when now you look at the, the pointing flux as a function of distance, it's not constant. There is, a, there is a significant loss of this pointing flux. So somehow the pointing flux is dissipated. And the pointing flux here is not numerically dissipated, but it goes into the particles, into energetic particles. So this is also the kind of thing that you can do with PIC. You can really, you can really connect the two, the pointing flux, the conversion of the two. So I will, I will come back to this too. Now let's look at the, uh, the case where I inject a lot of plasma into the, into the magnetosphere. What happens? So we're going to go through, again, the toroidal magnetic field, the currents, and the plasma density. So you see that it qualitatively it looks very similar, except that there is something going on here. Uh, well, you, you can see very well the current sheet here. This is the, the white color here. But you see it's not, it's not remaining flat. It's kinking. It's unstable. So that, that's kind of like the, the first thing you, that, that, that you can notice from, from this movie. Otherwise, uh, I mean, the, the field lines look very similar. Uh, this again, the closed zone here that you recognize and the open field lines that is kind of blowing this wind of energetic particles. And if you compare this solution, apart from the, the kinking of the, of the current sheet, if you compare the solution with what MHD is telling you, you find something very, very similar, or to even analytical solution of the split monopole, you find something very similar. So if you look at the current, uh, now we have a much more intense current. And, and this current sheet here is very well defined. And there's always this, uh, this again, this, uh, well, nowadays this separatrix that is much more, uh, much sharper than before. And you have, again, this kind of structure with flying positrons and flying electrons at the pulse that is carrying the current. And now if you look at the, uh, at the positron density, you have kind of similar to before, a little bit of charge separation. This is positrons. These are electrons. But overall, you can treat the plasma as quasi-neutral, so that the, the charge density is kind of smaller compared to the, the plasma density. So, so you, you are getting closer to the MHD description, more like when you have lots and lots of plasma everywhere. So in this simulation, you have stopped the particle ejection in the closed field lines. Mm -hmm. Yes. But at the separated field lines, you still eject. Yes. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's very important. Yeah. Um, this is, again, the spin down. So you've seen this curve before, except that now I'm, I'm in the high multiplicity regime. And now we, we found so we're somewhere here before. Now we get more like something consistent to force free, a bit, a bit more like 1.1 or something of the, 
for three solutions. But again, there is this important dissipation, 30%. So that's nice because, uh, as you remember from the beginning of the talk, we need to convert a lot of the pointing flux, so a lot of the magnetic energy, uh, into, uh, into energetic particles. So here we have 30%. So now, how does, it, how does this thing evolve with uh, the plasma supply? So it's kind of a summary of uh, how does this thing evolve with plasma supply. So imagine you have like an even more uh, charge-starved uh, magnetosphere. You have like about half of the spin down. And as you increase the multiplicity into the magnetosphere, you get closer and closer to the phosphor. So it's kind of as one would expect. Um, and all of these solutions present a very high dissipation rate, which is, again, not numerical, but uh, I think it's physical in the sense that it goes to the particles. And so I'm going to spend the last uh, five minutes or so <laughs> into the acceleration of particles. So now I'm going just to focus on the, uh, on the acceleration uh, in the solution of the high multiplicity, so the MHG case, which is more appropriate for uh, gamma ray pulsars. And let's see. How is this particle actually? We know they are, but how? how? How is this happening? So the best way to do this is just to say, OK, after all, I have all the information I need. I have all these trajectories of particles. So I just need to, to see what do they do. So the movie I'm going to show you is, uh, is showing you like a bunch of orbits of particles. Uh, so I, once the, the magnetosphere is established, I have reached this quasi steady state, um, I take uh, all the particles that are injected into the magnetosphere at this time, so all, uh, at the surface of the star, and I follow all of them, and I see what happens. So you have to imagine the injection all the time, but I will just follow those that are injected at a given time. All right, so this is what happens. So the blue dot shows you the, the orbit, uh, I mean the particle, where it is at, at this given time. And this is showing you the positrons only. So I'm going to play this again, but so you see that most of the plasma is just flying out, just flying out in the wind along the open field lines. And the guys here that are uh, trapped into the closed zone, they are just remaining within the closed zone. So there's a lot to say here, so I have to play this movie again. Kind of nice right now. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you, you see that, OK, well, let's talk about this guys first. Uh, you see that there are these particles that are trapped, but they are not returning back to the star. They are, they are mirroring back and forth along the field lines because there's a strong gradient of magnetic field. So it's kind of like on the Earth magnetosphere. This is Van, Van Allen belt, where the particles are trapped. They are bouncing back and forth uh, along their field lines. So this is what's happening here. But they, they kind of find their way, uh, if you wait long enough, they find their way out back to the star. And so you need to keep on injecting new. So there's, there's always some sort of injection in the closed zone to answer your question, because you keep on losing particles. But it's or not. Never settle down. Julian right, exactly. Right. So you need to supply it, but to a much lower rate. So there's some sort of like limiter in the code. If you want, uh, what is that, that period? What is that limiting rate? Like 0.1? Or, uh, um, in fact, it's on the, it's, it goes on the, on the magnetization of the plasma, the criterion. If it's not magnetized enough, I stop injecting. Um, right, so you see that uh, particles are also trapped at the Y point. Uh, around here, and in the current sheet, things are just flying out, just flying out. And there's another type of orbit I would like to, uh, to point out. Some of the positrons in the polar cap return back towards the, towards the neutron star, uh, and one even bouncing back again, too. But this one, this one we, we just go back in. Uh, OK, so here we don't have any information on the energy of particles yet. Now, if you, this is the same orbit that I just showed you. I just now plot the, all of them, like all their track. And it's kind of nice because you, you can see the field lines here of particles because it's, it's well magnetized, right? So this is, this, this is expected. So you can recognize the separatrix. This is a kind of the last open field lines, uh, where, or at least where the, the, that separate the particle that will be trapped or the particle that will just escape through the white point. So here is the white point, the, called the white point, because now, if I plot the current sheet, now it's more like obvious that it looks like a Y, <laughs> because of the Y current. Um, but some of the particles, it will be more obvious when I will show you the electrons, have a, uh, are not quite following the field lines. 
Right. And, and uh, yeah, I forgot to mention this, but the, uh, like, almost all the motion could be described by E cross B drift. So the, the particles that are flowing out here are just E cross B drifting. Now let's look at the electrons. Again, the same uh, kind of uh, structure. So you see how things are pretty much the same. But look at these guys here. They are not flying out. They are returning back towards the, towards the, the, the pulsar, the neutron star. And they will find all their way back to the star. So remember that these particles, electrons, they carry the current in the current sheet. So if you have current, uh, you need to have either, so if it's quasi-neutral, you need to have either both species, one going a bit faster than the other, or you need to count the stream. So it turns out that here, they count the stream in the current sheet. It's kind of something I didn't expect, actually. Uh, and now you, you do, again, the same artistic uh, view, where you have more or less everything looks like the field lines, except in the current sheet. Look at this uh, huge orbit here. These are called the spicer orbits. They are kind of special orbits because they are, they are not like in a uniform uh, magnetic field. The magnetic field is, is flipping from one hemisphere to the other. So the particle is like doing half of a Larmor radius. Then it's the, the, the magnetic field changes change direction. So you have to, to do another one and so on. There's this kind of strange orbit. Now I'm going to plot electrons and positrons, but only those that have an energy uh, above a gamma, a gamma factor of 1,000. I, I will tell you why 1,000 later. All right, so this is what happens. They all line up. They basically, you see the current sheet with just the energy particles. So it's kind of the proof that the current sheet and the separatrix is the region where you have the energy particles. But now, if we, if we look at individual particles, and let's say a typical uh, positron, the, uh, the a function of, of time to see where the acceleration happens is you find that the, the acceleration happens mostly in this region here. So this is between this, uh, this triangle here and this uh, square here. So the square is at the Y point here. So you see it gets like a, a kick uh, somewhere here and like another kick at the, uh, at the Y point and accelerated to very high energies. So for the, elect for the positrons, it's, it's fairly easy. The trajectories are, are always, they always look like, like that. Now, if you look at the electrons, things are a bit different. So they count the stream with the, uh, with, with the positrons. They carry the current as well. And they do this uh, spicer strange orbit here. And again, they gain this energy. So at the end, they will experience, both of them, the same potential drop, which is uh, something like that, like between the last field line here that is closed and the Y point. And then they would just, they would just keep this energy until they precipitate back towards the star. So if you put all of the particles together, you have this kind of map. If you map like the, where the high energy particles come from, this is what you get. You get this uh, very bright Y point and the separatrix here. This is the, uh, the mean energy of the plasma, a function of uh, uh, in every point. This is for the electrons. So electrons are concentrated around the Y point and not somewhere else. There's a little bit here, of course, but not so much. But the positrons, on the contrary, they are flying out. They are not flying in back. They are flying out. And their energy is increasing uh, with distance uh, in the, the separatrix. Now, wh where does this number come from here? Why 1,000? Why 2,000? And so on. Why is that? Well, this is, I think this is the last thing I will I will mention today. Uh, oh, okay. Be before that, just something uh, uh, quite interesting. So you have these electrons that are, you remember, flying back towards the neutron star to very high energies. So it's a bit similar to what happens in the Earth. In the Earth, what happens is that you you have the solar wind that is kind of deforming the the, the magnetosphere of the Earth, and we think that is reconnection in the back of the tail of the magnetosphere, and this reconnection is uh, shooting electrons and positrons. Uh, and ions uh, back towards the, so one part goes to, the, to space and the other part goes back to the, to, to the Earth. And when they precipitate back on the Earth, you have this nice uh, aurora, aurora on, the, on the Earth. So this would be a bit like the relativistic equivalent for, for this. Um, 
but it's it's not guaranteed that they would they would have any signature because they they might probably cool before they uh, they reach the neutron star. Um, right, and so the, the last thing I would like to mention is the 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 energy. All right, what, what's the energy that this particle reached? The maximum energy. So we, we did some uh, different uh, simulations with different magnetic field on the on the surface of the star. So everything is the same, but the the actual uh, magnetic field on the surface of the star. And what you find is that um, the uh, the mean energy of these high energy particles correlate uh, with so the mean energy is here of the particles correlate with the magnetization of the plasma. So it's a measurement of how magnetized your plasma is. So if you find such, co such correlation, it means that you dissipate all the energy that is given to you in form of pointing flux, and you, you give kind of democratically to all the particles in the current sheet. You give them this mean energy. So it's kind of nice to, to show that this is indeed the case. It's kind of something you, would, you might naively expect, but this is what the simulation says. All right, so I will, I will just wrap up and kind of give you some overview of, uh, of this talk. So we have all of this uh, exquisite data from uh, the Gamma Ray Space Telescope Fermi. We have lots and lots of very precise data, and not to mention just gamma rays, but also, also at all the wavelengths, of course. And we still need to explain those. We, they are still not fully understood. Um, so thanks to the imaging simulations that were done, performed in the last decade or so, we now have a very precise uh, description of the magnetosphere. So I think everybody more or less agree on that. But nowadays, now that we, we have like more powerful computers, we, we can use peak simulations to a meaningful size that we can simulate macroscopic systems, such as uh, Purcell's magnetosphere. And we are really able to, to, to tell where acceleration of particles talk, uh, come from. And we can really test these models for a cap, outer gap current sheet. We are really, really able to tell. And it seems that at least all the studies so far uh, are pointing towards the current sheet, towards this region in the wind uh, or the Y point. And we can also resolve this kind of more subtle effect, like kinetic effects. Is the current sheet really flat? Is it stable? Uh, and by the way, this instability is also dissipating some amount of magnetic energy. So there's, of course, a lot more to be done, in particular in the, in the pre-creation physics, to have more self-consistent uh, injection. To, but this will be very tough if we want to do things very properly. Uh, but this will be probably uh, uh, done by in the future, for sure. And eventually, what we want to, to get, we are not there quite yet, but we want to, to be able to model gamma ray light curves, to, to, to be able to, can we, can we explain the spectra, et cetera. So what I've shown you is, is 2D, axisymmetric, align rotator. So we can, do, we can do better than that already. Uh, so the Sasha Filipov, the Anatoly student, is running now these peak simulations where you have uh, now an obliquity between the, uh, uh, the magnetic axis and the rotation axis. So it's just a little advertisement. So there's a lot of things going on here. But the point is that there is this current sheet here that has this uh, spiral shape that you can, you can get. You can get particle acceleration and so on. Um, and this is in the, in the regime, again, where you dump plasma everywhere in the magnetosphere to get to, close to the force free. So it's a, it's a work in, in progress right now. Thank you. Just let me know. Uh, we probably have time for one question or so. Why does the electron process on the fusion look different? If you make the spin go the other way, would the table goes? Yes, exactly. So in, in real pulsars, uh, you, would, uh, you would have to extract ions at the poles, and which is much more difficult than to extract uh, electrons at the poles if you flip the, the omega. So it's not clear whether this object would exist at all. Uh, I don't have any particular opinion on that, but yeah, that's, that's what will happen. If you have just electrons and positrons, you would just flip electrons and positrons. Yeah. Simulation, yeah. is there explicit asymmetry between those between no. no, 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 there's no asymmetry. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's thank them all again. Thank you. There will be cookies upstairs. Oh, nice. How nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it took me a little bit longer than I expected, but. Well, this is yeah. your first time giving these talks.